So it's a great pleasure to have you all here. I am Tansi Whalen, Director of the Center for Sustainable Business here at Stern. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to our dean, who is uh, leading the school. He came to become dean uh, just a short time ago. And already we're seeing a sort of terrific uh, growth in the school and in our ambitions and, uh, and also in support for sustainable business. So Raghu, thank you so much for being thank here. You. Thank you, Tansi. Good morning to all of you, and uh, welcome to the event today. Uh, as Tansi said, I'm Raghu Sundaram, and I have the uh, honor of being the Dean of Stern, and to welcome you to today's event. Um, I want to begin by thanking our, uh, our, our sponsors of today's event, Bloomberg, Dotmark Corporation, and the Harvard Business Review for your support. Um, as, uh, as Tansi just mentioned, sustainability is something we take very seriously at Stern, and today's event has convened some of the leading experts in the field to talk about ideas that are developing. And it is our hope that our students who are around today listening to all of you will sooner or later join, follow in your footsteps, advance the work that you have pioneered today. Sustainability is one of our key focal points at Stern because it is really vital to everything we do today. It is embarrassing that so late in the 21st century we're still having to make this case for business, uh, for business interests and others, but it is obviously to many of us in this room plays a central role in, what, in the world that we are in today. One of our sponsors, uh, to whom I was just talking, who will uh, speak after me, mentioned that when he was a student at Stern, just eight years ago, Stern had all of two courses in sustainability, and he said he had to make up his own, own <laughs> curriculum at that point. Thanks to Tansi's leadership today, we have, we have increased that many-fold at both the graduate and the undergraduate level, where we have a social impact core, a sustainable business and innovation specialization, and we've gone beyond that. Now, a, a semester ago, we pioneered our first online certificate in, uh, in sustainable business. Two years ago, Stern had no online presence. We started our first online certificate courses. Today, we reach 105 countries. Students from 105 countries have taken our courses. And I'm particularly pleased to report that the course on sustainability, which was started last semester, was the largest of any, any of the pilots that we've done. It was a remarkable success from the word go, because this is an area where people are thirsting for direction and information, and very few business schools are actually focusing effort and, and, and uh, and uh, resources on it. Sustainability is one part of a broader drive at Stern to foster what we call responsible leadership, the leadership of tomorrow. Um, sustainability is housed at Stern within our business and society programs area, which also houses our Center for Sustainable, I'm sorry, for Center for Business and Human Rights, which also houses ethical systems and does a lot of very important curricular work, work with students, advising work with corporations and others. Um, in addition to the business and society programs, which is, uh, which is uh, at the forefront of many of the innovations we're doing in the school today, Stern has also been innovating in many other areas to continue to stay what, continue to be and stay what we consider to be the most relevant business school in the world today in terms of what it is doing in terms of entrepreneurship, technology, and many other areas of, 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 of business. So with that, let me congratulate Tansi for putting together yet another wonderful program and invite one of our sponsors, Lee Berlin, to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sundaram. And uh, thank you to Tansi and <coughs> Sophie, <coughs> excuse me, and, uh, and Holly for putting together this great event that uh, this is now the third year that we're all gathering today. Uh, my name is Lee Ballin. I'm uh, uh, head of sustainable business programs at Bloomberg. And as uh, was just mentioned, I'm also a Stern graduate. So it is really great to see the uh, field in, uh, mature in the academic world um, because uh, I also teach at Steinhardt a class on uh, corporate social responsibility. And I've guest lectured throughout the city, including here at NYU. And I got to tell you, there is a, a thirst for this information amongst uh, students and future business leaders that we really need to address in order for us uh, to move the needle. 
So uh, one of the things that I love about this particular event, it, it's really twofold. One, uh, I see a lot of familiar faces in the room. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of events in this space, uh, but in true Tomsey fashion, this is not an event where you just sit and listen to a bunch of panels. She's actually gonna make you work. And she's actually gonna probably give you homework if I know anything about to like Tanzi. So you're here, you're getting a free breakfast. Make sure you do the work that she asks you to do. <laughs> um, second, and for those who are, uh, who have seen me speak before, I, I apologize for this is gonna be a little bit repetitive. But the other thing that I love about the theme of this event is that it is highly aligned <clears throat> with the work that we're doing at Bloomberg. So what is that? So the first is reducing our environmental impact, walking the walk. By doing that, by converting to clean energy, by reducing our uh, energy consumption, by turning off the lights when nobody's in the office, uh, optimizing our supply chain, We've saved $116 million since 2008. That's just good business, and that's a good return on our investments. The second thing that is aligned with this and that we're trying to uh, do as our role as a honest broker of information in the financial markets is to provide data, transparency, clarity on sustainability efforts by the business world so that the financial, business, financial community can properly value sustainability in, the, in their investment decision-making process. That's providing environmental social governance data on the Bloomberg Terminal, providing transparency on the ever-growing green debt market. It's uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, or now rebranded Bloomberg NEF, um, and providing clean energy insight and analysis on the clean tech world, right? So that's core to our business. And that leads me to the third thing that we're really focused on doing, which is creating a proper market infrastructure that accounts for these externalities that we're all focused on addressing, both environmentally and socially. So that takes you know, shape in our support of SASB, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, and bringing that data into the Bloomberg Terminal. That's working closely with uh, the, uh, Mark Carney, uh, the governor of the Bank of England, and his work with Mike Bloomberg to create the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, which is seeking to you know, increase the visibility of carbon-related risk and opportunity in different scenarios versus a, a, a cooling or a, a business as usual or an extreme uh, warming world. These things are, are super important to financial markets. They're super important to businesses in understanding what their business will look like. And it's super important in trying to get the um, funding that we all need to ensure that our businesses are, for lack of a better word, sustainable as we move into uh, the next couple of decades. So uh, with that, um, I'm gonna hand it over to Tanzi, I believe, but I wanna uh, thank you all for taking time out of your busy days to come join us for this third uh, practice forum. And uh, thank you once again, Tanzi, for making it all happen. Thank you so much. So, uh First of all, thank you so much, Lee, and many thanks to our dean as well for all his support. Um, I really appreciate the leadership that Bloomberg is showing, um, both, of course, most importantly, in supporting our event, but, um, but also more broadly um, uh, in, in the various initiatives. And, uh, and I also want to thank Dom Tarr, um, who has uh, been kind enough to support uh, the event today, but also whose CEO, John Williams, has been the chair of our advisory board for three years. So um, welcome, everyone. Welcome to our speakers. Welcome to our uh, board of directors and others who are here. I'm Jeff Gould from uh, NYU Board of Trustees is kind enough to be here today, which is terrific. Um, so I want to note that today's events, these are some of the announcements my, my team has here. Today's events are considered on the record. Media is in attendance, and we will be sharing um, information on social media, so 
you know, be careful what you say. Um, in addition, we are live streaming several sessions and are recording today's program so that people can hear all the words of wisdom uh, that come out through, through the day. Um, so uh, let me um, move ahead with talking a bit about the return on sustainability investment. So today, one in four dollars are in some form of ESG investing. 85% of the companies in the S&P 500 are issuing sustainability reports. Now I say all that doesn't mean that the sustainability strategies are perfect or that of that, uh, that $1 of four is uh, in robust ESG investments, but what we see here is a really significant and growing trend of investing in sustainability. But all of you know who are active in this space, we are continually arguing the business case over and over and over and over again. So why, right? Because most companies are not monetizing the return on their sustainability investment, or ROSI as we've decided to call this. Um, so why not, right? Because assessing ROSI is complicated to implement and there's many different sustainability strategies that a company will have. The strategy and execution are in different departments. So you might have one related to HR, one related to manufacturing, one related to um, supply chain, all in different places. They're not tied to total return from the outset. The financial benefits, if they're tracked at all, are tracked different, in different um, units and not aggregated. Some benefits are intangible, for example, risk mitigation or employee retention, and are difficult to measure. It's not clear, for those of you in sustainability who've talked to your finance people, it's not clear to the finance people that there's a significant enough financial benefit that would justify tracking ROSI, putting in place the infrastructure to do that. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the companies that we work with when we've been uh, analyzing the return on sustainability investment for them, uh, he said to me, this is the first time, I've been telling my CFO for a long time there's money being created here, and uh, this is the first time that he's actually believing me, right, now that we've got these numbers together. Um, and um, unfortunately, investors, even ESG investors who are, who are asking data, asking for the ESG data, are not asking for the return on that sustainability investment data, right, um, and, and neither are board members. So those, and I'm sure you can think of other reasons for why we're still arguing the business case, but uh, these are some of them. So at Stern CSB, we set out to figure out how can we begin to tackle this. And if you remember last year, we unveiled ROSI, our, uh, our methodology for assessing the return on sustainability investment. And basically what we saw um, in our analysis is that when a company embeds sustainability core to business and strategy, it improves customer loyalty, employer relations, innovation, media coverage, operational efficiency, risk management, sales and marketing, supplier relations, and stakeholder engagement. Now, any kind of good management will improve those things, right? And the point of that is that sustainability is a new driver of good management and then can deliver, you, uh, can deliver better financial returns. So how we go about then taking those broad concepts, those mediating factors, and then turning them into monetizable data. First, we identify what are the material ESG issues using, Lee, you'll be happy to know, SASB as a uh, guide. Um, for, uh, and then we look at, uh, against their strategies, what are their initiatives, and what are the practices that they use to implement. And then we identify, uh, based on those practices, the specific benefits through that mediating framework that we saw. Is it innovation? Is it risk mitigation? Is it employee engagement? And then we quantify and monetize those benefits. So just to give you a quick um, reminder for those of you who were here last time, the first pilot that we did a, a year ago was looking at deforestation-free supply chains, working with McDonald's and Carrefour, looking at beef in Brazil. And what we found through applying this methodology is that through the uptake of sustainable agriculture practices and deforestation-free commitments, ranchers saw a 2.3 increase in productivity. They went from zero to 70% high-quality beef. There was a seven times increase in profitability. They earned up to $29 million at present value over 10 years. 
um, and 20% reduction in carbon emissions, which at, what point, at the point that there would be a carbon market for that, they could also make money. We also saw benefits for the slaughterhouses in terms of reduced risk, improved supply chain stability and quality. If, you're, if your ranchers are um, doing better, then you're less likely to have a challenge with getting the pro uh, premium product from them. Up to $100 million NPV over 10 years, and retailers, similar set of benefits, up to $40 million. Um, I'm going to go into some other examples in much more detail so you can see how we do this. But over this last year since we launched Rosie, we have seen a number of different initiatives emerge out of uh, using the, the uh, the um, methodology. So in the automotive se sector, the focus has been to assess the contribution of sustainability strategies to margins and valuation. In the apparel sector, which will be kicking off shortly, to assess the contribution of circularity and worker well-being programs to corporate financial performance. For one food company to assess the intangible financial benefits for suppliers of participating in the sustainability programs. For another food company to assess and monetize uh, climate risk and interventions for the supply chain. And for a pharmaceutical company to begin in from the beginning a ROSI assessment of their EHNS strategy and include metrics for assessing ROSI upon execution. So these are some of the things that have started to happen in the year since we launched this uh, ROSI methodology. So I'm going to start first with a groundbreaking study that we just um, announced uh, uh, Monday, um, looking at the ROSI related to sales and marketing for companies investing in sustainable products. So um, currently, there is no uh, comprehensive data on consumer purchasing of sustainability marketed products available for companies to build into their marketing plans. So for those of you who work in CPG companies, for example, and you're trying to talk to people about investing in uh, bringing forward new products, they'll say, yeah, people say they want to buy them, but they don't really buy them. We don't really have the data on it, so on and so forth. Well, so we said, let's go and see what's actually happening here. So we partnered with IRI, which is a um, company that collects uh, a point of sale data on consumer packaged goods in all channels in the United States. We looked from 2013 to 2018 across 36 categories, excluding alcohol and tobacco, um, even though I'm sure we could find some or get, you know, sustainable products within those lines, we decided to uh, exclude those. We looked at 71,000 products, and from this we created the NYU Stern CSB Sustainable Share Index. Um, and Randy Kronthal-Sacco, who's here today, has been our lead um, from, Stern, uh, from Stern CSB on, on, uh, on putting this together, which just announced it at IRI on, on Monday. So our question was, have purchases of sustainable products increased over time? The answer is yes. Products marketed as sustainable are driving not only product, but total category market growth. So first, across all the categories studied, sustainability marketed products account for about 17% of market share, up from about 14% in 2013. And when we look across the categories, they delivered about $114 billion of sales in 2018, up 29% from 2013, and expected to grow um, to $140 billion by 2023. Here's the cool thing. Despite the fact that sustainability market products are almost 16% of the market, they delivered more than half of the market growth. Right? This is a big deal. And sustainability marketed products grew 5.6 times faster than conventionally marketed products and 3.3 times faster than the CPG market. For 90 per, more than 90% of individual product categories, the growth of the sustainability marketed products outpaced the growth of the respected categories. Okay, across everything from, I know it's hard to read there at the bottom, it's hard for me to read here, uh, from um, uh, laundry care, diapers, chocolate candy, uh, household cleaner, um, skin care, et cetera, right? The three where we did not see um, outperformance were toilet tissue, cups and plates, and paper napkins. And that is because those are often private label and we had no visibility into private label. When you actually go and look in the stores, most of the private label are actually labeled as uh, certified recycle or other things. So if we were able to have uh, visibility into that, we think probably this would be close to 100% 
of the individual product categories are seeing the growth in sustainable products outpace the growth in conventional products. So for those of you who are saying, where's the case from a marketing perspective, right, here's the case. One thing I should note is that we made no attempt to determine whether the products that were marketed as sustainable were actually sustainable, <laughs> okay? Our goal was just to understand if uh, they were being marketed as sustainable and that people were purchasing based on that understanding. So then we had a second question. Are there specific categories in which the purchases of more sustainable product options out or underperform less sustainable alternatives? And the answer was yes. Uh, categories that, de that demand high functionality um, do not have a large percentage. Nevertheless, they were still growing and outgrowing their categories, okay? Um, categories with low functionality demands tend to have a higher category consumption. So, so you can see some examples here. Um, where which uh, yogurt, milk, uh, coffee, et cetera, having more than 18% market share, trash bags, laundry care, carbonated drinks, et cetera, less than 5%. Again, let me stress, even with those that are less than 5%, they were outgrowing their, the sustainably marketed versions were outgrowing their conventional peers. So looking forward, we, um, we plan to continue to explore the data um, looking at uh, research questions such as, are there demographic or psychographic differences in purchasing behavior? Are there geographical differences? Does the price affect the purchase behavior? Are there differences between price bands? So one of the questions that I've gotten is, well, so does that mean that it's just um, you know, expensive right, stuff that people are buying? But actually, we know that some of these are commodity products, and those are growing too. But so we want to look at that in more detail, right? Um, and are there differences in retail out outlets, right? Is some, is some retail outlets uh, you know, seeing better performance than others, and why? So a whole series of questions we look forward to answering. So any question, let me stop here and just see if anybody has any questions on this. Yes? Could you stand up and speak up a little bit? Sorry. So the question was, did we look at what the P&L benefit was, these products, the cost, the margins, and the products? No, this is a strictly a marketing study. We were looking at consumer purchase data and looking to understand consumer purchasing patterns. We were not looking at P&L issues. Yes? How did you Yeah, so we defined, and we have a long methodology, so I'm not going to go through it all. <laughs> but for every category, we literally looked, Randy and his team, team of students literally looked at every single SKU and um, identified third party certifications, um, uh, so, some self claims like uh, GMOs, ex you know, no GMOs, et cetera. We did not include something like natural because we felt that that just meant nothing. Um, so it, for every category, we had to go through and, 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 and uh, lay that out. We were pretty expansive in it, but we were careful, again, like, for example, not using natural. Uh, yes? I don't think we, we know that. Yeah. Hello, I'm Rand. <laughs> Um, no, we just, IRI does scan, any uh, UPC code is scanned, and IRI captures all that data, but we didn't look at spend relative to, to the conventional counterpart. I can tell you that I'm very familiar with all those businesses, and they do not outspend. Many are commodity, and they do not outspend. Often it's just what their conventional counterparts, often it's just the marketing of the package on the shelf. One last question, yeah. Yeah, I was just curious if you had also broken down whether it was economic, social, or environmentally based, because sustainability means so many things to different people, and we're trying to figure out you know, what resonates the most with those. Yeah. So we did include social. Um, governance is not something you generally see branded, you know, um, 
certification programs and things related to it, but there are, definitely are social. So we did include things like fair trade, for example. Um, we did not break down the difference between them, and that would be an interesting additional research project. So let me encourage you, you saw Randy, so if any of you have further questions on the study, feel free to attack her after, <laughs> afterwards. Uh, but we're, we're and it's on, the study's on our website. Um, we're really excited about this. There's, nobody's done this work in at least 10 years to analyze this across all categories. So um, hopefully this will be a good um, arguing point for you in, in talking about ROI. Okay, I want to turn now to Rosie in the automotive sector. Um, so uh, again, here we looked at, at pretty much all of the drivers of sustainability performance. Um, and we partnered with Aston Martin, who you'll hear from later, Volkswagen and GM. And um, we first interviewed the uh, C-suite executives across all the different sectors from marketing to finance to sustainability to ask them about the material SASB ESG factors and, w and which ones they saw as having a material impact on financial performance. And you'll see there's pretty consistent um, agreement across all the, from reduced waste, energy usage, conflict minerals, engineering um, retention, sort of all these different categories that indeed there is a financial, um, material financial impact of, uh, of implementing these strategies. So then we um, went through and, and more rigorously identified what the key sustainability strategies were for the automotive sector. And what's interesting is you're starting to see really uh, a coherence and alignment across the different, uh, different companies that they all are generally um, using most of these sustainability strategies. And then we identified the key drivers of financial performance um, against each of those strategies. So just to give you an example, one of the strategies improve waste management. And as I told you, we then go look at different practices. So one practice of improving waste management is to re reduce, um, excuse me, to recycle paint and solvents. And when you do that, you reduce the costs for the wastewater and toxic waste disposal. You reduce the costs for purchasing the paint because you're buying less in the first place. And you actually, they were finding they were getting revenue because they had extra recycled materials from that. So people don't necessarily put together all those things to come up with what the ROI is. So that's just to give you an example of, of, a, of a positive benefit. So overall, what we found in the sector is that automotive sustainability strategies drive higher operational efficiencies, risk reduction, innovation, and growth. They contribute substantial tangible financial benefits and can improve earnings up to 3.7% of revenue. <clears throat> So just to give you an example of sort of some of the ways in which we monetize, um, so uh, looking at improved waste management, savings from using recovered waste, we then went in and looked at savings from using less virgin material and lower disposal costs associated with the recovery and reuse of solid materials weighted average per price metric ton. You don't want to get all, but just to show you the kind of rigor that has to go behind every single benefit that we analyze, how we monetize it. And just here's one in innovation, for example. Um, engaging con uh, consumers with sustainability through innovative services. So we looked at the annual revenue stream from sustainable services such as car sharing and vehicle security, emergency services. Remember, car safety is an important ESG factor for companies. Um, less wages and other SG&A costs associated with the services. So again, every single benefit went through this entire process. So some key findings. Current reporting frameworks may not be adequate for measuring the financial benefits, and re recalls was a really interesting one. So number of product recalls is standard reporting for the automotive sector, but not the financial impact. And the information on cost is needed to really understand the total financial impact, and companies aren't necessarily putting these things all together. So we looked at the average repair cost per vehicle times the average number of cars per recall. We looked at the average legal and PR cost per recall, and then we looked at the money spent on increased quality control, premium redesigned parts, additional training, et cetera. Um, we found that the benefit um, between one year and the next of a certain number of recalls um, was uh, was nearly uh, was more than a half a billion dollars for one company. Okay, um, again, not that money is not put together in any way. Thinking about how all these pieces fix together, fit together. Waste management, another one. You know, so operational efficiencies. Um, here we looked at um, the types of practices we looked at were process improvements. 
um, and, and so on. And we found in terms of results that there was cost savings due to lower spend on virgin materials, increased net revenues from sales to recyclers. Those were the two biggest buckets. Um, then reduction in water costs by using recycled water, energy savings due to lower use for recycled versus virgin materials, and reduction in waste disposal costs with an EBIT impact of $235 million um, for a particular uh, company. So you'll see, um, again, these numbers are in lots of different places. It wasn't that they didn't have them. It's just that companies don't pull them all together. Here's an interesting um, one from a decision-making perspective. So. Um, in Europe, they require automotive companies to recover and recycle materials from end-of-life vehicles. Um, and uh, uh, in this case, we looked at um, uh, the results were that 2.5% of EOL material was recovered and reused, and 10% was sold to recyclers in this particular case. They saw savings from this um, compliance requirement, um, uh, EBIT savings about 100 million. So what's interesting is, because this is only required in Europe, companies don't do it in the United States. If they did it in the United States, they could actually make money. <laughs> but they see it as a regulatory compliance issue rather than an opportunity to make money, right? Questions about this um, project? I'm blowing you away with how like, amazing it is, right? Yes? Yeah, just, uh, can you talk a little bit more about the reporting challenge? Right. So if you remember my first slide, so when we talk to companies, because over and over and over again, this is why we've developed this whole methodology, is that over and over and over again, companies cannot tell me when I ask them what the ROI is on their sustainability investments. Um, they can tell me, hey, I've, I've done this on energy and I've saved this much on, on energy, but that's about it, right? Um, and I think it's, 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 for the reasons I laid out, it's a challenge because current accounting systems, first of all, struggle with intangibles, Right? So some of this is intangible. Secondly, because these strategies are developed in a variety of different places and executed in a variety of different places, nobody is aggregating all that information. Right? Um, and in the finance function, they, I'm sure, feel like they have enough to do <laughs> without then putting in place an entirely new sort of system for, for collecting all this information. And because nobody's asking for it, because nobody knows that this is such important information for making decisions, right? Um, it, they're not, they're not, there's no pressure on them to start to shift that around. So that's where I think, you know, really understanding how much value is created will begin to shift uh, the, um, both demand by investors and the board to begin to see some of these numbers because it will really help with decision making. What about yes. uh, tax benefits? These tax benefits. <clears throat> you look at that? Yes. Um, and so I want to also highlight Elise Douglas, who's led this uh, work here. She's in the back. Um, <laughs> so we looked at um, financial incentives and subsidies and things as well, correct? We, we Could you hear that? We, that, that, that they, we looked at things like where there were incentives for EVs. We looked at the costs. We, so this was all net. But most uh, of the earnings benefits are pre-tax. Yeah. Most of the earnings benefits were pre-tax. But it's kind of an interesting situation because the consumer benefits, but yet you would think the demand would be better because they net gain costs are lower. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, Phil Clawson from CSR Lab. So uh, these are amazing examples, and they all seem to be product focused. Are you doing research and having uh, examples from professional services, financial services, other service oriented or knowledge oriented? No, and I'm going to go through some of the other examples we're, we're working on. Um, nothing yet around financial services or product or um, consulting services, but if anybody's here and has a background in that, would like to work with us, we're entirely open. I'm going to take one more question and then move on to the next. Yes, Pam. Um, can you really Um, I think that, so what we're seeing, if you're, if you're talking about an EBIT, you know, sort of increased EBIT of up to 3.7%, yes, then it would absolutely uh, meet the hurdle rate. What we saw across all the different strategies, for example, is all but one of them was making significant money for the company um, now. Right, uh, and then when we looked over a five-year NPV, we saw a continue, you know, really significant um, positive benefit. At least, anything you want to add? Yeah. Um, in this study, we really just measured one year's worth of, of improvement in the <coughs> so we really didn't have enough data to really look at a specific ROI by like just strategy that would be Okay. Thank you. So now I'm going to talk a bit about Rosie and the value chain. So we've been working with Mars, who has created a livelihoods fund um, to improve economic and social outcomes with farmers. Uh, and they and their suppliers are funding a fund that pays NGOs to train the farmers, set up a direct commodity selling system, et cetera, with the goal of having high quality, sustainably uh, produced products. So um, they wanted to really understand the case for, for their, their suppliers to invest, and the suppliers in this case are the off-takers, not the farmers, the intermediaries. Um, they wanted to understand the financial benefits for suppliers to, uh, to invest in this fund. So we identified five benefit categories and 22 monetizable benefits, which I'll go through. And we then developed a tool for Mars to actually monetize the value of those benefits to enumerate the financial benefits for their off-takers to get buy-in, um, to identify mechanisms to price in the value of these benefits and sourcing agreements, and to help stakeholders monetize these, these opportunities. So the five categories of benefits were a stable supply chain, sustainable supply chain, long-term contracts, um, the actual sustainable product, brand value and innovation, and corporate risk. Um, so things like increasing the number of sort of stable commercial partners, mitigating price volatility, um, uh, reliable access to higher volumes of high quality product, um, uh, reducing reputational risk uh, and scandal as just sort of some of the examples. Um, and so then we, again, went through and monetized each particular benefit. So we looked at the benefits, and then we identified a monetization method. And then you don't have to pretend, you don't have to read this, <laughs> but just to give you a sense of the type of tool that we then gave um, Mars to work with with their suppliers, where their suppliers, and they could go in and enter the data so that they could come up with um, the value of the interventions. Um, and so finally, the financial benefits were calculated in separate sheets, you know, based on the, on the user's inputs. So we had, um, you know, for example, here, increase the number of suppliers that were professional commercial um, partners. And each of these could roll up. So you could see the different, under those five different buckets, where the value was being created. And you could also project out over a period of time. Any quick questions on this one? Um, so just some um, additional initiatives. I'm trying to see what time we're at. I think we're doing well. Um, hold on. Let's pull out my... It's quarter of. Thanks. Um, so some additional initiatives. Uh, we are rolling out a Rosie in the apparel sector. Um, HSBC has funded us to do this initiative. We have two companies, but we're actually also have commitments from uh, the two companies that we have on board are Eileen Fisher and Reformation. But we also have um, two other companies that have signed on with us, one a large department store, another a large retailer, and we're in talks with uh, two or three other companies as well. So we'll be looking, as I said, at circularity and also at worker well-being in the supply chain um, to, again, monetize benefits. And before I move on from um, Rosie, one of the things that I want to say here is we are not at 
the Center for Sustainable Business saying that all investments need to provide a return on, on investment, right, and sustainability. So you may be investing in things where there isn't a good return. So this should not be used as an excuse, uh, right, to say, well, we shouldn't be investing in something because we're not getting a good return. But what I am saying is there is so much value being created that nobody is tracking and that good decision making, which could help us to scale these things up much faster, is not happening because we don't understand the numbers, right? So that's, that's sort of, I just want to underscore kind of why and how we think about Rosie um, in, terms of, in terms of our sort of strategy around sustainability. Um, another initiative we are launching uh, with the support of Goldman Sachs, PepsiCo, and um, some others uh, that we're working with is looking at how the UN Sustainable Development Goals can be a roadmap for investment in New York City. So our goal is to identify and launch opportunities for the private sector to invest in helping New York City to meet its sustainable development goals and do this in a multi-stakeholder process, right? So that we have community organizations, entrepreneurs, corporates, investors, governments, the UN, et cetera, here really helping to come up with ideally about 10 initiatives that will help move the ball forward and really get private sector financing into, um, into some of the key issues here. I mean, just imagine, for example, how do we make affordable housing green, tie it into urban mobility solutions, help bring food, uh, higher quality food to those food deserts, right, using smart tech and other things, just as an example, right? Um, so our, our ambition is big, but we, we are excited about the opportunity to, to move this forward. Um, and when you look at sort of the work that's been done at a global level, uh, the um, Business and Sustainable Development Commission identified that the SDGs could provide $12 trillion of economic opportunities, 380 million jobs, looking at just four of the SDGs, and um, all of them are relevant in New York City. Cities, energy, materials, health and well-being, food and agriculture, as an example. Um, so finally, uh, we, we, um, couple things. We invite partners to help us pilot and test Rosie. So um, last year we got a number of people coming in as a result of our, our, uh, our work here. So we're happy to uh, entertain engagement. Um, we are developing tools uh, to integrate this approach into quarterly and annual reporting and we welcome partners in this. We're exploring the role of sustainability in driving innovation and also would like to know if there are particular cases that you all have that you'd like to share with us. Um, we welcome participation in this UN SDG initiative um, and we have great students who are willing and able to uh, intern and work for you. You've met one who, you know, came out okay. So, uh, <laughs> so hopefully uh, uh, you'll help us develop other young, young people. Um, I want to, before I, uh, oh, and yes, a little, little promotion. Um, myself and uh, Dr. Kerry Krasinski will be offering an executive course on sustainable finance and ESG investing, April 8th through 9th. Um, and so if uh, you have people in your team, if you're an investor and you have people who would, you'd like to learn more about this, uh, around, about ESG, they already understand finance, but they really need to understand ESG and sustainability, please uh, send, them, send them to us. Um, I want to, before I move on and talk about the agenda, just say a few thank yous and point out a few of our team members. We've got a terrific team at the Center for Sustainable Business. Sophie Rifkin, who's standing over here, who's our Senior Associate Director. Um, Ulrich Atz is, is uh, next to her, who's our uh, Research Associate. Um, Tracy Van Holt uh, is here, who's our Academic Director. And um, Eliza Heeks might be downstairs. Eliza Heeks and Holly Williamson are both downstairs. And I got Elise and I got Randy. And Kevin Eckerly over there behind the pillar, um, who's our lead on corporate um, outreach. So um, I, I, again, couldn't do all this work is being done with these great, great people. So um, uh, really exciting to, to work with them and work with you. So thank you.